Welcome to the Big Picture Podcast. We are here with Mike Lucas, a propulsion engineer working with the aerospace industry. Mike, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, it's uh, great to be on. Could you tell us a little bit about your work? I've spent, I guess, seven years now in aerospace industry, doing mostly, I guess, the study of structures, how they act when you apply forces to them, mm-hmm. and also how they vibrate when they're exposed to oscillating loads and giving uh, feedback to engineers to try to better design them so they could withstand all of the environments that they're going to face. Stresses. Stresses, yes, ex- exactly. Stresses, displacements, fatigue, cracks. That's my bread and butter, yes. Aerospace meaning uh, airplanes? Uh, no, so I work on the space side of the aerospace oh, cool. spectrum. Yes, exactly. Ah, so you're looking at equipment that's going to be up in orbit around the planet. Yes, equipment that will be in orbit and also the equipment that helps it get there. Rockets is the number one and only way that humans have figured out how to get to space. What about a space elevator? A space elevator? That would require the form of very exotic engineering materials, which you'll often see headlines being touting as the next big thing. But I've heard quotes that say... We have yet to build a footbridge out of these materials, much Let less alone a space, a space elevator. elevator. So yeah, so well, it is possible that yet you yes, you have the properties that are required in you know a base material to build a space elevator. Mm-hmm. It's much different to actually build the you know thousands mile tall structure you would need to get out to geostationary orbit. Yes. How about a transporter? A transporter. <laughs> well, what if someone told you that the transporter worked, but the part that deleted you was malfunctioning, so they just needed to point the uh, death ray at you if you would just hold still for one second? McCoy was always frustrated, thinking he died every, was reborn every time he was. Through the, yeah. Uh, Who's yeah. to say? <laughs> <laughs> you graduated from college, twenty twelve. Correct. Okay. Could you compare and contrast the amount of? Sp- stuff you learned in college compared to the amount of stuff you've learned since college? Well, I would definitely describe the uh, things that a professional engineer needs to know as sort of like a language. And you need to understand the fundamentals of a language maybe before you kind of can expand on that. Students come into the class and they see we're speaking in English, supposedly, <laughs> but there are all these terms that, this vocabulary that they're just not familiar with. Yeah. Dokeometry, uh, chemical bond, an atom, a molecule, kinetic energy, potential energy. Mm-hmm. And you look at the glossary and you're like, there are a lot of new vocabulary here. What does each term mean? And one thing I try to emphasize is that it's, the ideas are, pretty basic, but they're new, which means you need a new language for it. So people will often confuse the complexity of the ideas with it's just being a new language. If someone's speaking French, you think, whoa, they must be really knowing something special. And they're talking about how to order a hamburger. Exactly. Yes. (laughs) I mean, I like to think that you can only say that you truly understand a concept when you can explain it to someone who is not an expert in the field. Ooh. That's that's kind of my, my acid test and something mm-hmm. that I very much enjoy doing because the way that I learn things, it's very frustrating because I feel like I read a lot of uh, different sources and textbooks and jargon and eventually I find those few key words which make the concept crystal clear to me. Mm. And it's this may be an illusion, but every time that I learn a new complex concept, I I just think, you know, if someone had gone back and whispered like the two or three critical sentences that it takes to like explain the concept as opposed to just the more jargony aspect that I find mm-hmm. on, online, the core of a concept is almost always quite simple and can be explained with very few words and very simple language. So that's what you're talking about. If you could explain it to someone, you know how to dig to the very core f- few words that cover the essence of that. Yes. Concept. Yes, because things don't necessarily need to be complicated, or if they appear complicated, that's only because it's a simple concept built on top of a bunch of other simple concepts. Ah, gotcha. Yes. We actually addressed this in an earlier episode when we were talking about the idea of frames, frame being a mental construct. In many ways, it can sometimes be a filter that colors your worldview. 
and a frame is something that gets built in, in one's head over time. And what we learned uh, from there is that a frame is activated by words. Hmm. So a few key words can activate this whole structure. So for example, when you think tax relief, just those two words suddenly click a lot of uh, conservative sort of framing that's in there. So, that, so it like turns on, those two words turn on this whole network, and they call it a frame in there. Hmm. And so I think what you're alluding to is similarly, uh, with uh, you find a, a few key words that will activate much more than just those two key words. There's a bunch of un- underlying structure that you're taking advantage of. Yes. If, you, if you just said tax relief to someone from another planet and they didn't have taxes, then it would make no sense. You know, from, from the person's perspective that understands how to play a board game, it's incredibly simple. Um, yeah, and yeah, yeah. if anyone has ever <laughs> or an interface <laughs> or, or an interface right and yeah. if anyone's ever tried to learn a board game you know how frustrating it is <laughs> once you know it it's as simple as a, as a few words when you were in college could you describe your learning style Uh, Dig into the book? Well, one thing that I always found was key was I would often, you know, the first step is basically the first step on the pyramid of knowledge is to listen, um, but it's very easy to be entertained and listen. And then the next step, which is kind of hard to do, is to write down what you're listening to. You know, Mm -hmm. that seems like kind of a trivial step, but it actually is quite important, even if it's not nearly as pleasant as just sitting back and listening. That's very key. And then the next step when you're learning on your own, you know, when you're in the library or in your dorm room or whatever, trying to get better at the concept that you heard, you might often read over your notes. And that's useful because you basically have translated what the professor has said into something that makes sense to you, Uh, you you know, like your own personal shorthand often. But even then, that's not quite enough. The next, and I think the, the critical step, which is the hardest thing to do when you're preparing for an exam, is not just to breeze over your notes or the textbook and going, ah, yes, I know that, I know that, of course. Looks familiar. Looks familiar, exactly. Yeah. I've, I've, I've read that a hundred times because I literally have, yeah. is to then maybe close those notes or just open your mm-hmm. one cheat sheet mm-hmm. and try to work a problem. Try, try to work a new problem. That is incredibly difficult, and that is the true test as to whether or not you know something. And actually, I'll say that type of challenge is something that is uniquely difficult to college. Hmm. I, I will say that is exceptionally hard. <laughs> Even as someone who has been working in the you know, industry for several years, uh, during you know, several challenging projects, thinking back to trying to work a problem from a college textbook is probably one of the unique challenges that I've faced. So if you find that difficult, good, you've reached the summit, I would say. <laughs> huh. It's amazing that you, <clears throat> using the word step, in an even earlier podcast, <laughs> we refer to this as step one, step two learning. Okay. Step one is where you're inputting the information. Step two is when you're outputting the information. That's it. Whatever you do, it's going to be either input or output. And the thing is with input, you sit back and listen to a wonderful lecture or reading a really slick, smooth paragraph, uh, everything is like, ah, smooth as silk. You think you're you're ready. Mm -hmm. But as you're pointing out, that's not really the case until you've tried to output, as you said, writing it down, or as you said, closing the book and trying to solve the problem on your own. So we call that uh, step one, step two learning, and I'm tickled that you use the word step. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me ask you, in terms of an industry where you're working, mm-hmm. uh, do you see that application there as well, uh, in terms of step one, step two, taking information and putting out the information? It's certainly... Or is it more less, problem it's, solving? It's, it's certainly less clear, clear cut. Um, I will say, like, in my role... On the spectrum of like pure practical, like turning and tightening bolts versus coming up with new equations and theories, I'm probably maybe 70% of the way towards like coming up with new theories and only 30% of the way towards turning bolts. So what I'm trying to say is I'm, I myself am kind of edging more towards like the 
problem solving technical side of things. You know, mm-hmm. I did that on purpose. I, I enjoy that type of stuff. But, you know, even for someone who leans that way, it is not as clear cut what the input and output is. Mm-hmm. It is often kind of a gradual, more trial and, and error. Like I will learn about a new concept. I will try to duplicate it on my own specific problem set or the tools that I have get an output that makes sense and, you know, refer back to the technical literature that I found. So it's, I would say it's more of an organic process. And that's why I say, I find that maybe a little bit more streamlined. It's a, uh, certainly a shallower learning slope on a day to day than Mm -hmm. it is in college when you're faced with a brand new chapter of brand new topics and you're asked to work problems on it. I think Mike, you have just spelled out what we should call Step three. Step three. (laughs) Whereas step one and two is pulling in the information. And so it's incorporated into, let's say, your frame. But what you're talking about in terms of your daily work is synthesis and coming up with new ideas and problem solving. To be able to do that, I would think you'd need a certainly a command of uh, a lot of technical information it's slowly built upon over time but you're saying your the bulk of your daily tasks is is really more like what we might call step 3 where you're synthesizing problem solving using all that you the foundation that you learned applying uh, certainly the fun part of my job yes <laughs> yeah and i i will say that that third step uh, synthesis when i was first Faced with that in my first college projects, you know, someone drawing on a whiteboard for I- for ideas, uh-huh. I can I can think back to it and basically mentally rejecting it as just really unpalatable. Uh, it was just something that was like wild blue sky, like you know, wild blue sky. What are you doing out here? You know, there's so much more to learn. Why are we just going off on our own? Um, mm-hmm. And it was probably just because I was intimidated by it, to be quite honest. But yeah, now it's it's something that just comes with experience. That's the that's the only way to put it. You know, now it's something where you can just look at a problem and immediately come up with a couple ideas and pointers and it's really natural, but certainly before you have that experience, it's really scary. You know, if it's, you know, if if, if it's hard or challenging maybe to uh, you know, work work the problem, it's so it's almost inconceivable to to think, you know, how can I expand the pool of knowledge, you know, like, like who, who am I to do that? Right. Yeah. Like, like how am I qualified to do that? Uh, But I think it's a, the challenges that are going to move humanity forward are extremely broad Mm -hmm. and they don't need to be maybe the most cutting edge ideas and they could still be very value added. That's very achievable for anybody, you know, given enough experience. And I guess, Maybe it was the most challenging thing at the time, but you know now it seems a bit more natural and certainly not as mentally tasking as you know going to the end of the chapter and working the problems. Okay, here we go. Step one it tends to be passive. You can actually relax into it. You can get a false sense of security. And step two, not many people want to do. Homework is an example of step two. <clears throat> it's hard. You're having to put a lot of mental effort forward to really nail it down for that exam. You've got to do both step one, step two. Now, what you're pointing out here with step three, um, whereas one might be comfortable, step two might be difficult. Sounds to me you're saying that <laughs> step three can actually be enjoyable. Yeah. In fact, I would say step three, it is always self-propelled, almost by definition. Mm-hmm. It is, if I were to hear this, you know, 10 years ago of me listening to me say this, uh, it would mm-hmm. it would maybe scare me off because it's so far from what I would con- conceive of myself. But, you know, truly, it, you know, as you gain a skill set, gain some depth, gain some breadth, when you seize upon a problem, which you know, like, hey, you know, what if I tried this? and it could just be a small tweak of an existing tool, Mm -hmm. uh, it will be entirely self-propelled.
this sort of thing doesn't come every day either. Obviously, yeah. you know, we're we're talking about pretty pretty fundamental uh, inspiration. Would you say you're a rocket scientist? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would say that no one would describe themselves as a uh, scientist. In fact, uh, where where I am, mm-hmm. in in fact, uh, fun. Fun fact, it is almost a derogatory term of a topic or exercise if it is deemed a science project. Because, uh-huh. what, because what that entails is that you are delving into something which is... Basic knowledge as opposed to applied yeah, technology. How are, how, yeah, exactly, exactly. Like, you know, it would be a science project to figure out the sensitivities uh, of this input to this broad array of outputs. We could go down that path. But you have a job to get done, and that's to get a rocket into space. Yes, and that's often described by the millions of subtasks that it takes. To, uh. It could be fun to do science projects, you know, like that kind of what I'm describing as that step three can be deemed as a sort of science project, but typically it more means coming up with a new idea of how to do things faster. We distinguish earlier on in the course the difference between science and technology. Technology is, is applied to some purpose. Would you classify yourself as a, a rocket technologist? <laughs> <laughs> I would classify myself as an engineer. I think that's engineer. a very apt term, yes. <laughs> oh, okay. So here, sort of a lead into the next question. Your career requires a fair amount of technical expertise that you gain over time. I'm wondering about the social aspect of it in terms of working within a community of other engineers. How much of your job would you say relies on just the sheer technical and how much of your job relies on the sheer social? This was described to me and I fully agree, so I'll repeat it here. But mm-hmm. when you get to a certain spot and people, especially, you know, people have been doing something for a while, often they've gotten good at what they do, everyone gets the technical stuff. That is not what makes you special. Everyone is good at what they do, you know, to varying degrees of it, but it will be very difficult to differentiate yourself just knowing how to quote unquote turn the crank. Mm -hmm. What makes you special is being able and what is in fact, or uh, rather than especially mean valuable, valuable, I would say, yes, um, is to uh, interact with others and collaborate and get something done. That's certainly the hardest part of my job. And I think that in college, you know, the Holy Grail was, you know, let's work on the most technical thing possible. That was always kind of my goal and what I viewed as the most worthy challenge. And, you know, it was worthy because it was the greatest challenge, right? Let's, mm-hmm. let, let's work on the most te- technical thing. And, and anything that, you know, delved more towards the soft side of skills, I was not, not dismissive of, but I, I would put secondary, I would say. Now it has become increasingly clear that it is the soft skills, you know, the, the hard skills will get you in the door and they will eventually come to you. It is the soft skills which are, is going to really propel you and that's, that's the lifelong challenge. Wow. Uh, I got to tell our listeners that uh, today you took us on a tour yes. of your plant <laughs> and I saw hundreds of people working together. Gosh, what a system each one a very critical cog in a very large (laughs) machine. (laughs) I was very impressed in terms of how do these people work together on the same project? Mm -hmm. Wow. I think what you were seeing was probably more on the production side because it was, you know, Mm. we, we were just from our location. We were on the shop floor. And I would say, you know, that that does take a lot of collaboration in terms of safety and making sure that the best practices are being shared and mm-hmm. communicated between the people assembling the hardware and those that are designing both the hardware and the process. The communication that I'm most familiar with is more of, hey, we have this set of requirements that were laid out in front of us. How do we best achieve that? Who do we need to work with? What is the scope of this challenge? You know, that's that's a bit more free flow. I would say that's That's a very difficult challenge, yes. Wow. Mm. How much math do you use on a daily basis? I use quite a bit of math. Is it mostly algebra or calculus? Um, I would say math is... (laughs) Arithmetic. Arithmetic. (laughs) I would say all of the above, actually. Yeah, 
so I deal with vibrations a lot, and a lot mm-hmm. of times vibrations are you need to understand statistics. A lot of inputs Uh are not what we call deterministic, as in we know the minimum and we know the maximum and we know the average. We know the general shape, um, the general frequencies at which they'll occur, but we don't know the exact cycles. So a lot of times you need to look at things through statistics. And so when you think about statistics, you're thinking about algebra, you're thinking about integration. Standard deviations. Standard deviations, derivatives. Also... Uh, I deal a lot with, um, you often hear the term high power computing. That's kind of a keyword that you can look up, but it's basically using computers to solve physics problems. Hmm. And what computers are really good at is what's called linear algebra. And that is not, as I initially thought when I heard that term, the point slope form. Y equals mx plus b. Y equals mx plus b. It's more matrices. So vectors... And groups of vectors aligned and multiplied How by they one add. another. So, mul- yeah, it's basically computers. Almost every computer problem is just solving. You know, typically, if you have two equations and two unknowns, you could solve them. What my the bread and butter of my work is assembling a system of equations with a million equations and a million unknowns, <laughs> and solving for the unknowns. To remind the listener, what we're talking about here is a piece of metal that's <laughs> going to be subjected to all sorts of forces, temperatures, and temperatures, and yes. brrr, as yeah. the rocket is <laughs> taking off into outer space. Is that piece of metal going to fatigue and break apart? What are the tolerances of that little piece of metal? We are talking with someone who looks into that yes. detail. Exactly. Wow. Exactly. Yeah. Do you see yourself going into space within your lifetime? Short answer, yes given sufficient advancement. It's really just a numbers problem. I think the current price that NASA is paying Russia to fly uh, an astronaut is $80 million. <laughs> okay. So Th- There have been millionaires that have purchased yes, tickets. Certainly, then, right? certainly. There's been huh. probably close to 10 people that are just private citizens that are wealthy enough to buy a ticket, and they hang out on the space station for a few days and then come back home. So it needs to be much cheaper than $80 million dollars maybe something on the order of a once in a lifetime trip you have to understand how much of a drastic change it would be to even have a ten thousand dollar ticket as opposed to a an 80 to 100 million dollar ticket yeah so the the other thing that needs to come down is right now i think it's like on the order of like a like a one percent chance of uh death safety safety Yeah, yeah exactly so this is an old question as a society why go into space there's so much going on here on planet Earth that needs to be dealt with. Well, that's kind of the default question. I guess I can play my role and give the default answer <laughs> is that you cannot solve all problems before moving on to the next one. Oh. If that was the test given to any endeavor, nothing would ever get done. Mm. I think it's an entirely valid question as to whether or not someone should be forced to spend part of their paycheck to fund space exploration. Well, look at what satellites have done for us. Y- and yes. Communications and for farming, even. Yes. And I guess if you play the whataboutism card, hmm. there are plenty of other things that we spend money on that are less worthy than space exploration, to be sure. But, I, but it's I, still a, f- a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of other budgets, right? Certainly, but I've seen a lot of these new space companies essentially grow themselves without needing direct, unlimited government funding. Mm. You know, the economy themselves has been able to propel them forward. Now, Mm. there are always roles for government and fundamental research. There's like a long history of that. These new space companies would not be where they are without the decades of NASA experience. Mm. So the public supports the private. Yeah. I personally would vote to spend a portion of my tax dollars to it, but I don't necessarily want to say that. that that, Yeah, Yeah. exactly. (laughs) 
So, a bunch of students have an exam yes. coming up <laughs> next week. Yes. What study advice might you have for them? First, start by going over the notes, preferably notes that you have written. Okay, review the notes. Review the notes. Well, take notes. Take notes first up. <laughs> and then review the notes. Distill the notes. Distill, I find, what do you mean by distill the I notes? I mean, I have many notebook pages that start with the title Notes of Notes. I find oh. that extremely helpful because uh, I take notes. Kind you summarize of, your notes. I summarize my notes. That uh. is, that's, a, that's very effective, yes. And then that is often what makes it into my you know, crib sheet or cheat sheet, which is you used know, if for You know, if you take a note of your notes of your notes, then, if, <laughs> then eventually you're going to end up with those two or three words that summarize <laughs> Maybe that's what I'm the getting big at, picture. Yes. Exactly, exactly. Ah. That's what I can reference to reliably often work the new problems, yeah. Preferably previous exams. <laughs> oh, okay. yeah. Because, like, you know, oftentimes you'll get the textbook questions and then sometimes there'll be examples from old exams. Oh, yeah. That's super helpful. So that's on the technical side. What about the students running into anxiety and all? On the social side, what advice might you have? I have had, like, in the, in the context of anxiety of taking an exam. Yeah. So, I have had my head spin. Because if you choke. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Choking happens for sure when yeah. you're in the middle of an exam. Uh, this is something that I heard and I have done and it has helped me. When I'm in the middle of an exam and I read the yeah. paragraph yeah. and nothing, not a single word gets through and I think I have 37 minutes left. This yeah. is one of my exams. This is going on my permanent record. It's going to affect my GPA. I think I'm going to get a zero <laughs> on this exam. My life is over. <laughs> Let me read the paragraph again and try again. I get stuck in that loop. Yeah. What I find myself doing is, okay, I can't understand this paragraph, but what I can do is I can just stop and get, get out of my head and be, this is a chair. This is a notebook. This is a pencil. Mm -hmm. This is an exam. Here's the words on the page. Basically, I have to reboot my own brain. <laughs> is really? what I'm saying. <laughs> the the, the I, Michael Lucas reboot yeah, brain method of methodology. Yeah, I, I have to start with basic. It, and I think all that that is is almost like a meditation to yeah. to like get me to like slow down, stop, look at something. So something is choked. Get into the cerebral cortex, mm -hmm. and this method here you're talking about is a way to release exactly that choke. Whatever you could do to. Um, reset things and Deep often breath. thinking about consequences is not yeah breathing exercises yeah. you know there's any number of ways this is my own personal so because maybe the, the longer you're choking on that the, then now you have 35 minutes <laughs> <laughs> oh the choke becomes self-defeating yes exactly wow. exactly so it's because it's it's rough 50 minutes you know it's not much time to take anything I'm excited uh, we walked upon this idea, uh, let's call it a new idea, it's new to me, of, of step three, learning, which we're classifying as the synthesis oh, yes. of everything we've learned before. And it's, it's exciting to hear about your detailed work within the aerospace industry. It, it sounds amazing, the love that you have for that and the social skills that are involved, how key that is. You said earlier, this struck me, that the, the technical stuff, or you called it the hard skills, uh, they're going to come. Everyone will get those, especially you're just doing it over and over again. It, it's going to come. But the soft skills are something that, gosh, sometimes you have to work on for because people are changing, mm -hmm. uh, teams switch. It's something you're going to work on throughout your career. Yeah. Mike Lucas, thank you so much for joining us here at the Big Picture Podcast. Oh, this has been great. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> On behalf of all of us, good chemistry to you. <laughs> and you as well. <laughs> all right. Oh, that was, that was, that was great. I hope, I hope that we were recording. Our theme music by Zach Jeffrey. Musical flourishes by The Silent Boys from their One Step Closer album. Production assistance from Greg Simmons and CPRO Music. For show notes and more, please visit conceptualscience.com. A note of appreciation to all instructors using Conceptual Academy. 
thank you for your support. And to the hardworking student, our thanks to you as well for your learning efforts, which we see as the path to making this world a better place. There's a bigger picture. That's good chemistry. Good chemistry to you.